So before we start, any questions? So this is another, this is an easy lecture in that I'm going to focus on applications. So last time I said something about the theory of absorption spectroscopy when executed with tunable diode laser absorption, where mostly we deal with room temperature. We call them room temperature, but they're thermoelectrically cooled. Uh, room temperature, compact, CW, diode laser sources, low power, a few milliwatts that we can buy between, say, 700 nanometers and, say, 10 microns. That means we're usually using uh, transitions that we've identified, uh, but the database is itself in something called HITRAN. So you don't have to go through all the spectroscopy that we've gone through for several hours. I ended up by giving a number of examples from aeropropulsion. What I'm going to do today, or this is the first hour, is go through some examples in energy conversion. So the hope is I'll touch on your interests and try to communicate to you the potential value of diode laser sensing, uh, the uh, broad utility of it to measure many different things over a wide range of conditions. So I'm going to try to use examples to motivate you in, and uh, ask questions about the theory. But for the most part, the theory is the same independent of the species. We need to know a line strength. We need to know a line shape function. We need to be able to pick the line that we want to use for a species we're interested in that uh, fits the situation we have the path length, the environment, and so on. So that's what I'm going to try to do for the first hour today. See, we're starting at 2. I've got to be done by, say, 3. All right. So, um, tunable diode laser applications to energy conversion. Uh, this is a picture of a an experiment, well, a picture of a place that we, the students went uh, recently. It's the National Carbon Capture Center. So this is now, what you're seeing is something is big. It's big. So the experiments might be some small thing in our laboratory. It might be some big thing in the field. And uh, there's some engineering challenges to do this, but you'll see how useful it is. I'm going to touch on uh, IC engines, uh, slagging coal gasifier, a transfer coal gasifier, it's a little different version, a coal-fired boiler or coal-fired power plant, and I'll talk about some future trends. So I'm going to look at a variety of different situations. Uh, some of these will involve water and uh, temperature. Water is uh, pervasive in the combustion spectra, so it's easy to use. We care about some pollutants here, and we'll make some fuel measurements up here. So that's what we're going to do for the next 50 minutes. Now, if I, this is my one overview slide. So a, a key message that I try to give is that this method is practical in difficult environments. It's because the equipment is portable, we can convey the light with fiber optics for the most part, and we've learned over 20 plus years how to measure many different things. Temperature, pressure, velocity, mass flux, there should be a dot there, mass flux, momentum flux, thrust. And uh, conditions up to uh, 8,000 degrees, 50 atmospheres or higher, 15 kilometers per second, multi-phase, we've overcome strong emission, scattering, vibration. So we've done this in some difficult environments. In an absorption measurement, you typically have to have windows. So there's always a window problem. How do you, how do you keep them cold enough? There's always some issues. Those are, but those are kind of engineering issues that we're, we learn about. Uh, we've done this in small scale and large scale. I would mentioned aero engine, in, uh, aero engine inlets, scramjets, pulsating engine engines, IC engines, I'll talk about that today. Arc jets, I think I showed examples from that in day one. Gas turbines, shock tunnels, etc. And so, and I believe that there's potential to use these sensors in control systems. So this was uh, an experiment. I think we went there twice, actually. The student, uh, Xing Chao, went there twice. Uh, this was uh, in the proceedings of the Combustion Institute. That means she did this in 2010. Coal-fired utility boiler, pretty big thing. Uh, coal gasifier at the University of Utah. That's kind of a laboratory scale coal gasifier. And uh, IC engines in collaboration with Nissan over the several years. OK, so we're going to talk about IC engines and uh, some of the things that you might do in an IC engine. So this is my view of how you could use diode laser sensing in an IC engine. 
you could have some combination of wavelengths that propagate by optical fibers that would allow you to probe the time evolution of flow in the exhaust manifold. Or you could use some fibers like this to probe the time evolution in the inlet manifold. And if you wanted, you could do this on multiple lines to get some tomography. Or you could do the hardest thing, which is to try to propagate or make measurements inside the engine cylinder, which is, of course, highly dynamic pressure, temperature, and so on. I'm going to show you mostly measurements we've made inside the engine. Uh, I've heard that lately some people are trying to do this now in the, in the exhaust, which is by far the easiest problem. It's the easiest problem to do by far in the, in the relatively cold, lower pressure exhaust. Uh, we worked together with Nissan over a period of years uh, we, and a company called PSI. We did some demonstration experiments at UC Berkeley about 2005 in their engine, because I don't have an engine in my laboratory. Uh, we measured temperature and water in those early stages. I had a student who went to the Sandia uh, Combustion Research Facility who measured temperature and water in an optical engine. Uh, and then we finally moved to a production engine uh, in 2007 where the student measured fuel and temperature. And uh, now, this student was especially interested in fuel. And I'm going to spend some time on this because fuel, is, fuel in a gasoline engine is a complicated question. What is the fuel? It's a blend of different species. And how do you deal with that? How do you measure through absorption and infer the concentration of fuel if it's a multi-component fuel? So we spent quite a while figuring out how to do this. Um, this is a representative plot of the absorption cross-section versus frequency near three microns of the structure for some sample of regular grade gasoline at 50 degrees centigrade. So we measured this with what's known as an FTIR, absorption spectrometer. So we evaporate some of the gas, put it in the cell, and we measure the spectrum. With a hydrocarbon, it's, it looks just like this. It's, there's not uh, individually resolvable lines. It's a, it's an overlap of many lines. Uh, it has typically the structure, and, and you can explain the structure in terms of the types of bonds, the bending vibrations of the hydrocarbon. But you have to deal with the fact that the gasoline is a blend of different hydrocarbons, and that's a bit of a problem. So they're not, no two samples are exactly the same. But this is the CH stretch period portion of the spectrum right here that we have to, that we're going to use. So essentially all hydrocarbons absorb in this region. Now, it, there's a variation with the composition of the gasoline, but there's also a variation with temperature. So now this is a plot, it happens to be premium gasoline from some source. And this is a plot of the spectrum at different temperatures, ranging from uh, room temperature up to about uh, uh, 800 Kelvin. That's a useful operating range. So what you'll notice is that much of it looks about the same, but there's a very temperature dependent feature right here. So that's good to know. So there are wavelengths, like right in here, that are essentially have a cross section that's independent of temperature. Good to know. Maybe you can pick that color and then you don't have to know the temperature. Or maybe you want to know the temperature, so you might park one laser here and put, park one laser here. But again, this is premium grade gasoline and we have to pay attention to the, not only the variation with temperature, but the variation with composition. So we typically, this, but this is pretty common, that is that this region is the one that has the strongest temperature dependence and this region is pretty much independent. So we typically will pick two colors, take the ratio to get temperature and then use the one color to get the fuel concentration. So we'll pick one with large temperature dependence, one with small temperature dependence and uh, use two colors. We can determine the temperature then from the ratio and then use the individual. So here's the problem. These were two different samples of premium grade gasoline. And we knew, uh, we had it analyzed, and we learned that the blue one had a low percentage of aromatics and the red one had a high percentage of aromatics. So already you can see some pretty big effects. Uh, there are some regions where the absorbance is about the same, but in mo for the most part, there's quite a big difference. Quite a big difference out here. So we have to deal with this. And we set as a goal can we find wavelengths that will tell us the fuel-air ratio by measuring the fuel and knowing something about the air? Can we find wavelengths that we can interpret 
in terms of fuel concentration and therefore the fuel aeration. So we set out to build a model for the cross section as a function of wavelength and temperature that would apply to essentially any sample of gasoline. And we base this model on the idea that uh, typically when gasoline is delivered to any kind of a research laboratory, you can find out the fraction that's a so-called paraffin, olefin, and aromatic. And in the case of the US, the oxygenate. And you can find out, perhaps, whether the paraffins are branched or linear. So at least at Nissan that we were working with, when the gas was delivered to them at the research laboratory, all they knew, and they didn't have any oxygenates, all they knew was the fraction that was paraffin, fraction olefin, fraction aromatic. So we said, if that's all you know, that the mole frac that some distribution between these three classes and the sum is one, could we use that knowledge together with the spectral information for all of the possible hydrocarbons that could go into this to come up with a simple model and pick these colors? So in, since we also dealt with some American uh, gasoline, we assumed uh, oxygenates were ethanol. And we chose that if, if the fuel grade was regular, we would take a certain split between normal and branch. And if the uh, fuel was premium, we'd choose a different number. So based upon just a few little pieces of information, can we build a model that allows us to make quantitative fuel measurements in uh, gasoline? So we set out to do this. And the student who did it was Adam Klingbeil, who finished up a few years ago. And so these are basically mole fractions of, the, of the, each hydrocarbon class. So there's five classes if we count two for the paraffins, and then the uh, olefins, aromatics, and oxygenates. Whereas in the case of the Japanese gas, I believe there was no oxygenate. So we did a bunch of uh, experiments, um, and we looked individually at representative uh, sets of alkanes, representative sets of uh, aromatics, so we looked at a wide range of these species, measured their spectra, tried to pick an average one. So we kind of averaged over each class, cross sections as a function of wavelength and, and uh, temperature. And then we blended it into this model to look for the wavelengths at which we had the least sensitivity to variations of composition. And then we went to a local, not a local, well, pretty local, Chevron was in California, and we got, I think, 20, 25 samples of gasoline, randomly chosen. And we just asked them to tell us this little bit of information. What was the percentages of the different? And you see most of these are, are heavily alkanes. You can't read the number, this is zero to 100. So, uh, so which were the, I guess that's, I'm not sure what that says actually. Let's see what it says here. On the left that you're missing. No, it's zero to 100 on the left. Okay, so it's a bar chart that adds up to 100. And, but in any case, the point was we got a large number of samples to try this out. And then the question is, how well did we do when we picked 21, it looks like. Chevron was about 50 miles away from us at the refinery. And uh, therefore, we did cover quite a range. And uh, we picked our targets, wavelengths one and two. And here's basically a summary of how well it worked. So at a temperature of 450 centigrade, the model versus the measured. So we would take that sample and that would and we'd measure the cross section. So that's over here on this side. And then we would apply our model based upon a year's work to identify the average cross section of that over that each of those classes and then to pick the wavelengths. And the bottom line is it works really well. So we were successful in finding wavelengths and cro average cross sections per class that allows us to measure absorption at two colors and from it infer temperature and the amount of the fuel. So if it had been a simple hydrocarbon, it would have, we would have saved a year, but it wasn't a simple hydrocarbon. So we had to do this for gasoline. So you could do it. You could use the same strategy of whatever the information you have is, which is typically limited to how much of each of these classes you have. That's enough information. And we used our FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared uh, Spectroscopy, to do this uh, because we need to get the spectrum. Once we have the spectrum, we can pick the colors and use lasers. Now, we have to have a laser, and we need a three, we call this a three-color laser. At the time we did this, these are tunable, infrared, 
3 micron lasers. At the time we did this, uh, there, you could not buy something like this. You could buy a laser that was tunable in the uh, infrared over a narrow range, but we needed three colors. And so uh, we were able to modify the commercial laser and get it to cre create what we wanted. We wanted two tunable mid-infrared colors, and we wanted one near, near IR color, a fixed wavelength, so that we could deal with the fact that there might be some scattered light or there might be some signal loss with a dirty window. So we always like a kind of a backup color. And the way this works is you have some, uh, you have a so-called pump laser and a signal laser, and these things mix in a nonlinear crystal called piplin or periodically poled lithium niobate. These are CW lasers. You tune this one, and it combines with this one, and out comes a color, new one. And you tune this one, mix it with this one, out comes another color. So simultaneously, you can produce three colors, new one, new two, and some sort of a throughput color, typically, say, the signal beam. So that means it's three colors. We typically, we may need two, but we use three to keep track of scattered light. So whenever you have a problem, you add another color. Somebody said, can you do that when there's droplet presence? Yes, add a color. Can you do it when the window has a liquid film? Yes, add another color. So there was one variation of this where we had four colors, and we could look through a thin film on the window or through scattered droplets and still get the vapor concentration and the temperature of the vapor. And so we, we did various experiments where we used the near IR color to get to say something about the droplets. Uh, what is their average size? What's their average volume fraction? You can answer certain things about the droplets if they're there. But the droplets are not there, always there, depending on the, on the type of engine that you're dealing with. Okay, optical access. How do we look inside the engine? Nissan was especially interested in what is the fuel air ratio as a function of time during the combustion cycle and at the time of ignition. So we have to measure the fuel air ratio right next to the spark plug, which varies with time. And the question is, what is it at the time of the spark? Does it vary from cycle to cycle? Is it different when you have cold start? So it's a local measurement made right next to the spark plug. And so here is a, basically it's a spark plug that's been modified. So it screws into the same hole as a regular spark plug, but it's been modified so that next to the spark gap is basically a small mirror assembly with a gap of about 5.3 millimeters. So that the round trip distance of the light that comes out here, bounces off a mirror and goes back is uh, a centimeter. So somewhere there's this laser, the light's propagating through a fiber, comes up to this spark plug. Some of the light comes back and is collected by a parallel optical fiber and goes to the detectors, two, two one for the near IR and one for the mid IR. Now, these lasers may be modulated in frequency. They don't necessarily have to be, but they might be modulated in frequency. And if they're modulated in frequency, then we can use one detector to look at two colors that are modulated at a different frequency. And there's some subtleties when you modulate these particular lasers at high frequency that causes them to drift in wavelength, but I'm not going to go into that. So the goal is to measure the fuel versus time next to the spark plug. Yes? Was there a concern about the interference or the change in the flow field around the spark plug? Sure. Because you add yes. essentially yes. the second yes. spark plug sure. to it? So obviously it perturbs the flow. Right. And so you got a little structure, you try to make it as small as you can, and of course you find out as you build it, well, if you don't make it beefy enough, it doesn't, it doesn't hold up. If you, and, and what you find is, well, what material should you use so that it reflects some of the light? Because of the schemes that I've been telling you about, we don't necessarily have to reflect a high percentage of the light. We just have to collect some light. So we had to learn that. So uh, it took time. It took, we worked on that program for about five or six years. So we learned how, how the design of this mirror should be. In the end, does it perturb the flow? Yes. But it, how else can you do this and get a localized measurement? So that's the price you would pay. And then, of course, you could, I guess, if you wanted to, you could ask yourself, how does it change if I change the design? How does it change if I rotate it? You can ask those kind of questions. But their primary question was, what differences do they see from cycle to cycle in coal star? That was like their overwhelming concern because they're worried about the emissions that come out in coal star. 
hydrocarbon emissions are high. So is there something funny going on about coal start? So their goal, and we want to do this in single cycle then. So I'm just going to show you just, and this worked. It's amazing. And the reason it works is because the absorption of the hydrocarbons is so strong, fortunately. Before this, we worked for three years, three years trying to measure the temperature in this gap using water vapor. And the, and the gap is so small. In fact, I think in that case, it was less than a centimeter round trip. How do you measure the temperature in real time with a small amount of water vapor present in, in, in this inside an engine? And it's complicated because the pressure is changing with time, the temperature is changing with time, the water is changing with time. All that, they just want to know the temperature. And so we, we really had to pull out all the stops to figure out how to get high sensitivity absorption. And that's when we really got into wavelength modulation spectroscopy. There's no way we could get to what we needed to do without wavelength modulation spectroscopy. So that's how I got into that game. And, um, but when you get to, to hydrocarbons, the absorption is so strong that it's a much easier problem, as you'll see. So here we are. Uh, we've got the in-cylinder pressure is in red. So here's compression. Here's the top dead center. There's ignition is like right here. So the pressure goes up, the pressure goes down. Here's the point of ignition. And the two colors are the absorption over here. Absorption, here's zero. So now the fuel comes in in kind of bursts. They can, they can control how they, how they load the fuel. But you'll notice that the green and the blue, they look similar, but they're not exactly the same. They shouldn't be the same because they're two different colors. One's more sensitive to temperature than the other. So, but you're measuring with good, so you look and you see how quiet is it before the event? How noisy is it here? Can you see all these? And you gotta remember, this is single cycle, so there's no fudging, there's no averaging here. And does it go back to zero? And so it works throughout the entire engine cycle. You see ignition, and then, and then the hydrocarbons go away. Good. So what they really wanted to know more than anything is, for, at this point right here, from cycle to cycle, how much was the fuel air ratio changing? They needed high quality, low noise data, uh, so they could do some statistics on the cycle by cycle variations. And uh, they needed this in connection with their effort to reduce unburned hydrocarbon emissions. And let's see. I, that's probably Jeffries and all of my associate at SAE 2010. So I'm only going to show you just a little bit. What is the peak value of the gasoline mole fraction looks like versus engine cycle over 400 cycles? So there's 400 measurements here. And the question is, what's this, the distribution in, in, uh, in these units over that? Now, I, what I'm not showing is the error but it's, it's uh, less than the spread. So this is relatively representative. So I would look at that and say, wow, look at this. The spread is really less than 10%. They were pretty happy. They'd never had that information before. I think that's, and this was a production engine. There's no window in this thing. It's just a spark plug. So yes, it can perturbs the flow a little bit, but the fact that it works so well gave me all sorts of ideas. You could use this to measure in different places in the engine. You bring the light in by fibers. I can see how you could really map out what's happening in the engine if you wanted to, want to do that. But then, then they became interested in electric vehicles and the funding stopped, unfortunately. But this really worked. This was a, a phenomenal success, yes? Was there any method of independent validation of the measurement? No, they've, I think they could, they could measure, they could probably extract some samples. Remember now, this is the value at top dead center. After, it bur after they ignite it, it's gone. So how do you measure at that instant in time? I don't know how you could do another way. You, I don't think there's another way. You could, probably, you could probably run the engine in its most reliable, repeatable mode and then try to get a feeling for the scatter in your measurement. You could do a few things like that. Uh, I believe this matched their calculations for their engine model. I, I think it matched. What they don't have in their engine models is something that shows this variation. We did some other experiments, I guess, earlier where we had uh, done something where we could compare with some sampling, uh, and we found good agreement. <clears throat> so I think this is, is a pretty powerful research tool if somebody's interested in engine, uh, engine uh, studies of different types. Yes? Uh, I remember you saying earlier that in a non-uniform flow, this technique 
Yes. The yes. This so is a path average over a five millimeter gap with some obstruction to the flow. That's what it is. So it's relatively uniform. I think the I think their simulations suggest that the fuel distribution would be relatively uniform. I don't think their simulations deal with the perturbation to the, so there's a lot of flow going on inside this. It's being mixed and swept through this region. And uh, I don't know that their calculations or simulations are good enough to get at that non-uniformity. In any case, they were more interested, does it vary from cycle to cycle? So well, this is what it is. This is the past average number. And therefore, this is the average across that path. After all, the spark plug has a gap, too. It's not a point. And, it's, and, it, and it sends out uh, a combustion wave. It's, it's not a point. So I'm not sure that you have to know the fine scale spatial resolution to, uh, to think that it's a concern. You could, of course, do, I guess, different lengths if you wanted to kind of study that problem. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about IC engines, uh, except that I think that this is a great area for somebody who is interested in engines and wants to do practical, fairly easy to understand laser diagnostics. It only answers certain questions, but certainly for the inlet, man inlet manifold, exhaust manifold, I could see all sorts of variations for inside the cylinder. It's doable. Yes? So do you think if you just had a fiber in, fiber out set up in the cell, that, that, that would work? Yes. Without optical access. Oh, well, the fiber is the optical access. Right. So you drill, so you drill, a, you drill a one millimeter hole and you stick in your sapphire rod and couple it up to a fiber and good to go. Wow. Now, what's going to happen on the other side? Well, some of that light that's coming, actually the end of this fiber is probably a collimating lens. It's probably a shaped end to your fiber. Okay, so the light is more or less collimated. So what I didn't show you is I did have a student at Sandia who measured all the way across. He was interested in measuring, he was in, they were interested in um, uh, HCCI engines. And, and where the idea is that you perhaps will just have temperature versus time, but it'll be kind of uniform along that line, and what is it? And, and so in that case, uh, uh, we had basically a collimated beam. Now it's collimated going in, but you got to go through the, the cylinder, which is, uh, we didn't drill a hole. It was the uh, quartz cylinder, I think. You have to go through there. We learned about something called the birefringence and the pressure inside the chamber is changing the transmission of the, a lot of problems that would be, would be avoided if you just drill a little hole, stick your fiber in there. Of course, it, it has to take the environment of the engine and collect some light on the other side or reflect it back. I, I can think of all sorts of ways to do this. And you don't, do you think beam steering? I would just think... The beam steering? Yeah, of course. We, so we've learned how to deal with beam steering. Yeah. So I hope that one of you will be interested in this problem and will come hire me. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've dealt, learned how to deal with beam steering. It's a problem. And we've learned how to deal with it. I always say the biggest problems are always interference emission, interference absorption, and beam steering. They're almost always the problems. So, and so each environment is different, but there are strategies that we've developed over, you know, been doing this for 23 years. So now that's an engine. An engine is, is one of the hardest things to do because it's such a dynamic environment. We get time resolution because we use CW lasers. So we, do we get an image of what's in an engine? No. But the people who do that, using PLIF, the method I'll talk about tomorrow, they get an instant, the instantaneous spatial distribution, perhaps, but it's not really quantitative, and it's not time resolved. So you have to decide what information you want. But for this particular problem, what's happening next to the spark plug, this was pretty good. I was pretty relieved when it worked that well. So we have some friends at the University of Utah. It's about 12 hours away by car. And uh, they are big on coal combustion, and they have a uh, coal gasifier. So the reason for the coal gasifier is clean coal. Can you take the coal, convert it to syn gas, burn the syn gas in a gas turbine, and get cleaner uh, energy? So this is some sort of, and the, and the gasifier itself is, uh, so basically um, pulverized coal is injected into some sort of a high temperature environment where it undergoes chemical reactions as it's converted to hydrogen and CO, ideally. 
So some sort, and, and this coal, so it's gonna slag. So this, this reactor is uh, small. I don't remember how many tons they burn or how long it takes to burn a ton. But they feed coal, which is not easy. Gotta grind it up, feed it in. It's really hot, it takes a long time to heat this reactor up. A lot of ceramic, it starts to slag, stuff's running down the walls. Where do you put your windows? How do you keep them clean? Turns out that's the hardest part, figuring out how to look through. It's not the temperatures that get you. It's the, it's the window, keeping the windows clean and dealing with the fact that there's slag inside, there's droplets of coal, you're looking through there, trying to figure out what's happening in the middle. So if somebody says, well, are you sure it's uniform? No, I'm not sure it's uniform. But we're getting something. We're getting, we're getting measurements of the temperature inside that they're not getting with the thermocouples that they've been bedded in the walls about an inch back in the ceramic. That they're not getting anything. And, we, and if you can measure species, we use species to get temperature. You can measure species, temperature, and so on. So that's the idea. And, and uh, ultimately, this stuff would come out and get cleaned up and then go into some sort of a gas turbine. And our idea is, and we're still being partially supported by DOE, our idea is that if you could make measurements of the, of the gas, of, well, they want measurements here to see what's happening inside the reactor. And then there's this place here where they, they spray in some water to cool it down and freeze the composition. Then it goes through some cleanup stuff. They really would like to know right here, before it goes to a gas turbine, what is the energy content? Is it varying? Do they need to change the input to the gasifier so that what goes into the gas turbine is more or less the same in terms of its potential to produce power? So, but su uh, successfully, this is easy. This is uh, almost as easy. This is a little harder. This is very hard. We eventually succeeded everywhere. But this is easier because the temperature is low, not very many particles. It's kind of uh, relatively straightforward. <coughs> OK. so. Uh, when we were there, they were mostly, we've been there about four or five times, I guess. And we, they were interested in gas temperature and syngas energy, especially the energy here and especially the temperature up here. And we got the temperature by looking at the ratio of two water vapor lines, 1.4 microns. They call this an oxygen blown system. Uh, I'm not an expert on coal, gas, on coal gasifiers. So there's a lot of species that are present. We've basically learned how to measure all of these. but. For temperature, we just use the water. Now, if you want to get the energy, we're missing one of the key players, hydrogen. There's no good way. You can't measure H2 by absorption is the problem. So you have to use tricks to get to, uh, to hydrogen. So we make measurements at four places. Uh, this is another cartoon of the system. It's kind of a vertical system. The coal comes in up here, kind of comes down here, gets trapped down here. This particle laden flow comes out here, and somewhere down here they try to clean it up, and then finally the syngas goes out. So we, ha we were charged with trying to make measurements at four places. This was the hard one, because this is up here in the reactor. It's really hot, coal slag, windows. We eventually prevailed. And basically, you have to decide if you, do you have a ceramic tube that's sticking out and a suppressed window, a depressed window? Or how do you keep it from co cutting over with slag? Do you blow it? A lot of different ideas that we tried in, with our partners at Utah. I think these might have been, might have been the very first optical measurements in a, in a gasifier. Probably were. Not an easy problem. And since then, we've gone to a bigger one. I'll show you in a minute. So we measured temperature. We measured some other things. And then by some of the mole fractions is one. So we tried to infer hydrogen. And from that, you can get to the, the, uh, the flux of uh, enthalpy or energy going into the gas turbine. Now, here's one problem. This is the problem we anticipated. You see, here's the absorption line for 25% water in air at 1,600 Kelvin over a path of 15 centimeters at one atmosphere. So there's a couple little lines. There's a strong line. Now we go the same mixture to 15 atmospheres, and it looks entirely different. There's no longer any place where the absorption is zero. So we can no longer tune in wavelength and find our reference intensity. That's a big problem. So that's, again, why we got interested in wavelength modulation spectroscopy, which is sensitive only to really to, to shape. Another problem. So one problem is the pressure broadening, which, which is present. And 
for the most part, hasn't been measured. So we have to measure it, understand it, or develop a strategy that's insensitive to that. Next problem. A lot of particles in this flow, so when you send in light, not very much comes out the other side. So you have to, if you're doing direct absorption I over I zero, you've got a real problem. And the solution was this technique I told you about called normalized WMS, which allows us to deal with varying transmission. So we, we developed that kind of, we started doing that for Nissan, and now we've been doing it for the gasifier. So these were some measurements they did. This is the laser transmission in percent as a function of pressure in the gasifier. This is at location three, which is downstream a ways. So when they were at 45 PSIG, we got about 10, 11% of the light came through. By the time we got to 150 PSI, 10 atmospheres, we were trans, uh, transmitting less than 0.1% of the light. But our method of 2F over 1F still works. You just have to have enough light that your 2F over 1F signals are, have good enough signal noise ratios. So this is pretty important if you're going to deal with a particle laden flow, which gasifiers are. And we found also, so this particle loading apparently goes up with pressure. They, do, they don't measure things like that. They don't know how many particles they have in there. They just, uh, they measure the pressure, measure the thermocouples in the walls. They try to measure over time the average amount of coal going in. It's not really very precise. So our method of WMS2 for WNF works really well. But as I said before, it's much more sensitive. It solves some problems. It's less sensitive to noise and it's 10 to 20 times harder. Because there's just some electronic complexities and understanding the mathematics um, and getting it right. And it depends on the shape of lines, so that you have to know the shape of the lines. So let's see, I think those are my two students there, one on either side. Um, so the five, okay, they're running this thing out in a room and they're probably 30 or 40 meters away in a control room when they run it, because this is high pressure, it's kind of dangerous. So they run these lines with optical fibers and put the, det actually the detector I think is out here. And then uh, they go back to the control room and they run it. This is the, and it might run for day, for days. Uh, this is the temperature in Kelvin versus time in the reactor. That's the hardest place, up here in the reactor where it's, they finally solve the slag problems. This is the measured temperature versus time. Now at this point it's a little hard to know how much of this is real fluctuations and how much is just scattered in the measurement because they have no information on this. Uh, they got down to as low as 0.02% uh, 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 transmission and they still got signal. So the students believe that this is real fluctuation. So you're feeding in coal. So, you know, it's not like feeding in gas. It's, it's fluctuating for sure. It's just a question of, uh, but it is a path average. So what does this mean? Um, we measured CO and compared it with some sampling measurements based upon gas chromatography, looks pretty good. Uh, they did some measurements with CO2, looks pretty good. So, but when you sample, they would take a sample and then they go study it for about 10 minutes or an hour, come back with a number. So the, um, they, could, they could give us a number every few minutes, but the sampling line and the time for analysis was longer than that. So I think they shifted the time to match it. So we got good agreement with, uh, for stable species, we got good agreement with these uh, sampling schemes. Uh, oh yeah, the GC data were just, there was a four minute delay. So they'd sample and it'd be four minutes before, before they dry it and get an answer. So we've shift, had to shift their data by four minutes to get it in agreement. Ours is real time. Methane, same thing. So we can measure methane. Methane percent looks like it's up to 5%. So methane, CO, CO2, water, temperature. The one we couldn't measure is hydrogen. That's where we have to use a trick of some kind. Here's the water. Now they don't measure water. They dry the samples before they analyze, so they don't actually ever measure water. But where we can, the agreement is good with the gas chromatography. Okay, now that's everything I'm gonna say on the university scale gas fire. Now we're gonna to go to the big one. Well, the big one. This is industrial scale. It's not the ultimate size. I think it's uh, kind of a prototype. It's not the 
ultimate one that would be used maybe by industry. It's the National Carbon Capture Facility, so it's the DOE sponsored big, big thing. A lot of people work here. And there had never been any kind of optical measurements at this place. And it took like a year to get ready to go because they're so safety conscious. You can't drill a hole in their, in their rig. And so if you're gonna put in a window, you gotta have a backup window and it's gotta have a pressure gauge and what happens if this fails, because they can't shut down. So there's a lot of safety issues that, that led to this. We started off with the idea that this thing would be small and it turned out to be, I don't know, 10 feet long, this thing that we had to attach to their reactor. So there's some processing here. It's, we were downstream of what's called particle control. We were not looking inside the reactor, which is over here somewhere. We, it was on the way to the on the way to the syngas consumption pool. I don't know what they do with it. So we we went into their their line here and built a rig which would allow us to. Um, here's the instrument shelter. Instrument shelter might be way up in the air, really hot, nasty. Send this light through fiber, couple to this thing, go through a sail a, a fail-proof kind of apparatus so that we can make a measurement right there, collect the light, go back to the detector. So it was a, kind of a big engineering job to do this. They were skeptical, but then they're pretty impressed now how well this worked, you'll see. Um, nominal conditions was around 600K, 15 atmospheres, here's their nominal composition. And we're 99 feet downstream of this, everything's in tens or hundreds of feet. We're, we're, we're 100 feet away from this device on its way to the, wherever the syn gas goes. This huge thing. Um, in this case, they claimed that they only transmitted 0.01% of the light. And we still get data. That's pretty impressive. Uh, here's this thing. So here's the duct that we want to measure across right inside there. But there's all this ceramic and insulation and steel pipe. So they ended up designing this, these huge, <laughs> these huge structures, and mounting it on an I beam that was bolted to this thing, all because of safety. Because you, you're not allowed to drill a hole and put in a window because what happens if it would break? So these are all lots of flanges and windows and safety devices. So I think the next time out we could probably simplify this a lot. But that's what happened. So it took quite a while to get it in place. You have to have redundant windows, and pressure gauges, and automatically closing that. So here's a picture kind of looking along this pipe. This is a pipe, and inside is all this stuff. And inside, finally, there's the pipe that carries the gas. And here's our structure. And it valves, and all because of safety. I think if you could convince them that you could drill a hole and use sapphire, and it would be completely safe, they could go for it. I think that would be better. So let's see how it worked. So here's the measurement of the mole fraction of water versus time. So now they start up they start up over a period of like hours, so like days. So they turn this thing on and they gradually bring it up and, and they heat with something they heat with propane and then they finally start putting in some coal. When they put in the coal, they put it in slugs with some period. So there's a lot of stuff going on that that we could resolve that they've never seen before. Here's a blow up of this region right here. We could see this, this regular pattern of water associated with the chugging of the coal. They'd never seen that before. And we could actually figure out then maybe how much water was going by and of course coal is wet so you can't, it's hard to make use of the water concentration itself to learn too, very much. Mostly we wanted to do the temperature. Now, and then was it 54 hours? We had left this thing running. In 54 hours, they did some sort of a shutdown. And the students had been there for a while, so they asked, the people there liked our stuff, so they asked if we could just leave it running. So the students left and actually ran this for a couple of weeks, I think, and it uh, just continued to work. Let's see, this is the, that's the particle control cleanup device. Uh, let's see, this is a reminder to me. They have ther thermocouples in different places, but they're kind of buried in the wall. Here's our sensor. And uh, here's our measurements of temperature. That must be in Kelvin. Oh, here's our TDL in blue. Here's their thermocouples. Of course, this is now steady state operation. So these are their thermocouples 
uh, in various locations 24 feet apart. We're, they're up here, we're downstream, so our number should be a little bit lower, and it is. So I would say that's really good agreement, uh, good agreement with their thermocouples. We can see the transients that they can't see. This was nice, this was, uh, what's this? They did something here at 107 hour, 108 hours. We could see it. So I think these things are real. The, the, the coal that comes in doesn't kind of just come in uniformly. It's kind of like a little wheel or something that causes these fluctuations in the amount of coal. Um, that we saw it when they closed certain valves that were part of our safety apparatus. We could see that. Oh, look at this. Yeah, we left. The students left. I stayed home. The students left. And uh, they let it run for, uh, I don't know, 600 hours or something, some 20 days. So it really is pretty, pretty, uh, used. and remember this is our first trip, first trip there. Usually it takes two trips to get everything to work. Light transmission was pretty stable, we had enough power, no de degradation of the windows, so even though these windows were kind of bulky and complicated, they worked fine. They don't measure water. Turns out that they really were intrigued by the fact we could measure water. I guess the way they do it is they take a sample every day or two and they condense it out and they see how much water they have. And so this was their condensed water at a couple of different times connected by some curves. We always found good agreement. But they were really intrigued by the fact, they have to go to a lot of work to get these numbers. So they were really intrigued by the fact that this thing would just sit there and give them the water without us being there in real time. So can, what, can the sensor reveal real time moisture fluctuations? Yes. So we can see these fluctuations in water. And let's see, what's the, therm this is the thermocouple temperature? Of course, these are all in hours or minutes. And these are pretty small changes in temperature here. Temperatures over here. Okay, two or more, okay, this is TDL and this is the thermocouple. So we can see some correlation between their, their thermocouple and our water. Okay, last example is a, a full-scale power plant. This was a student who did the work. She's graduated now. She measured NO and CO. She made two trips to this power plant, uh, somewhere in the southeast. This is the real thing. This is. Um, I think it was a 300 megawatt unit in a 1.2 gigawatt plant. And so the way these things would work, one of these uh, uh, burners and, and uh, I think they would blend the gases from three or four uh, boiler systems into one. So I think they had the capability for a gigawatt here, but, but each one of these units was 300 megawatts. And what they wanted to know at this place right here which is before this uh, uh, NOx cleanup unit based upon selective non-catalytic reduction inject urea was basically what's happening right there. You have to understand that most of the measurements are typically made up here. They can measure up here NO and CO uh, with a little bit of time resolution. We're down here in the, it's a it takes a long time for the gas to flow all the way out and get up here. I don't know how long it is, a minute or something. So this would be the first measurements like this, and we had to worry a lot about interference, absorption, and scattering. So the first problem is, remember after NO and CO, water is everywhere. So this was a plot of, the red is the absorption spectrum of CO at 100 ppm. 100 ppm of CO in the presence of 10% of water. So what you, have to, you have to look and find a place where the red still stands above the blue. Uh, we, can find, we found several places. So we have to do the high temperature spectroscopy. We have to identify the places. CO was pretty easy. This is CO. This one's NO. NO's harder. So this was uh, in 100 ppm of NO in water. And CO is not a problem interfering with the NO, but the water is. So you have to really look to find places where you can measure the NO, but you can find them. We found two good places. 
there's a lot of particulate in this flow, and there's quite a distance across now. And, but we started, continued to use this 2 if one if approach. This is what it looks like. So they had invested, before we got there, in building a place where there were some uh, openings, <coughs> openings. And they had built some sort of a pipe. That was, we'll call it the transmitter <coughs> pipe and the receiver pipe. And I don't know what this is, some sort of a shield. And uh, oh, here, here's the pipe sticking in. And here's the measurement gap, which is three meters. So they had done this because they wanted to defeat the, the role of the particulate loading. So we basically just adapted to this rig. We used 5.2 micron quantum cascade for NO, 2.3 micron 2DL for CO. That's the fundamental, that's the first overtone. Dusty environment. Uh, however, the path length is low enough and the environment has got low enough concentration <coughs> that we, that we, uh, we transmitted 10 to 15, 10 to 50% of the light. So it wasn't like the gasifier. This is to remind me that this thing is about 50 meters tall and the student is up here in this little window, I think about 100 feet off the ground. They said it was so hot up there that it was unbelievable. Uh, that they you couldn't stand in the same place very long on the on the grill because the bottom of their shoes would start melting. So it was pretty uncomfortable. And so they had to put the optics and the uh, the, the lasers and the optics have to be in, in, in uh, cooled boxes. So they're up there, here, and here in some sort of <coughs> air-conditioned boxes. Okay, let's look at CO versus time. Uh, and this is now CO in parts per million versus time in minutes. And uh, what they were interested in is, is uh, what's the minimum CO we could measure? When do you get the minimum CO? It's when you crank up the, ox the air. So they can vary the amount of air and see how that affects the CO. So when the air flow is high, the CO is really low down here, less than 10 parts per million. This is the region where they work. They tend to work in a regime with a safety margin. They pick a region where it's safe. So they want the maximum output of power they can get maximum efficiency and still be safe. And the thought is, well, if we had, if we had uh, reliable sensing, maybe they could get closer to some margin, some limit, and get more efficiency and save money on fuel. So if the excess air is low, it, the CO got up to as high as 200 parts per million. And their regular operation was down here around 20, 25. So we were able to show them that we had the ability to measure um, part per million level. And look how quiet the signal is. We can measure part per million level. It's really part per million levels at three meters. If the path length was longer, you could measure lower. But it's, uh, this is a blow up now of this region. And it looks like the, that's probably 10 right there. So we're down at around six. That's not our detection limit. That's just as low as they were able to get real time. So the advantage of this is that it correlates with excess air, it's real time, has the potential for combustion control, uh, eliminates the need to, to rely only on the uh, stack emissions monitor. Conceivably you could place these things closer to the combustor and learn something about the combustor. And then, then the second goal of this project was can we measure NO and test the efficiency of the uh, SNCR unit. So this is a 300 megawatt unit. Your re-injection comes in typically at 1300 Kelvin uh, and then uh, it does its job at around 1300 Kelvin and the question is down here at what's called the economizer exit, what's the NO level and how does it vary with the amount of urea that you use. So here's a plot of NO in parts per million. Looks like the minimum value down here is around 60 highest is about 135. So there's the NO level, goes down. So the NO level is reflecting the amount of urea that's added. And so if you knew that you were allowed to emit 50 ppm, you could just crank up the urea level until you reach that 50 ppm or 60 ppm and not anymore. Because if you put in too much, they worry about ammonia slip and then you have to measure the ammonia that comes up. So this was pretty successful also potential for control of individual boilers. So these boilers, the 300 megawatt boilers, feed into the same big stack that takes all, takes four, 
uh, units to get to uh, 1.2 uh, gigawatts. Okay, so uh, what I've shown you is an overview of how we use diode lasers over about the last 10 years for energy conversion systems. I've shown you different species. I've shown you uh, 1.4 micron lasers, which are cheap and economical because they're telecom. I've shown you uh, 2.3 micron lasers and 5.2 micron lasers. We're now using other wavelengths. Longer wavelengths give us stronger signals. I've shown you how we deal with uh, high particulate scattering, long paths, short paths, versatile systems, and uh, I believe that there's a lot of potential for control. So you have to convince these people that your stuff is, at, is robust, that they can rely on it. They're very conservative, don't like change, but if, they t if the uh, regulations uh, get tighter and tighter, then they'll be forced to, uh, to, to monitor the, these emissions and control them. Where's the future? Uh, more wavelengths, more species. We're interested in NO2. I'd like to come back to hydrocarbons and radicals. There's a lot of new advanced energy schemes where we could use some of this technology. So again, I've just given you an overview. Maybe there's something here that interests you. The physics is the same that I've been describing for days. Um, if you have some interest or some programs where you need our help, let me know. OK, I'll stop there. Any questions? Yes? Two questions that are kind of related. Is there some fundamental reason why you're measuring the direct flow and not, for instance, like a slipstream? It would seem like you could yep. do some kind of filtering and it would yes. be farther away yep. from the yep. hot gas section. So if, you, so if the thing was really huge, say, like they've asked us, could we measure 50 feet? Well, the big problem, yeah, we can measure 50 feet. The problem is maybe no light will come out the other side. If it's a particle-laden flow, we might not get any light out. So we have to play some tricks, and I've got some ideas. But the simple thing would be just to take some of the gas through a slipstream and put it back. You can do that as long as it's a stable species, and as long as you're happy that the way you're sampling it is reflective of what you want to know. So the nice thing about line of sight is it's kind of a path integral. It's, it's, it kind of tells you, like an NO across the duct is, is the total. You don't really want necessarily a spatially resolved number, because maybe it's non-uniform. So, yeah, you could do that, and that's what you would do uh, if you wanted to avoid some of the, and then you could lower the temperature while you're at it, and you could lower the pressure, you could, you could really optimize this. If you wanted to measure parts per billion, that'd probably be the way to go. Sample some, put it through a little cell, control the pressure, and you could just sit there and run in a cool environment. Uh, at that point, though, what's the advantage over extracting a sample and analyzing it? Well, usually when they do that, they extract it somewhere, and then they feed it through a line takes about a minute to get it over there. They can never measure a radical species. We could measure a radical species. If, so there's pros and cons, but yeah, you could use a slipstream. And there are times when you probably want to do that. Yes? Uh, in your laser uh, detection measurement, so the power of uh, the laser is always constant, or you can increase the power of uh, the laser so you can you know, uh, have a more stronger signal. Yes. Well, so the, the question is, can we use higher powers? Or sure, we usually buy the lasers that are they are they are what they are. They're typically a few milliwatts, although some of the newer quantum cascade lasers might be 50 or 100. Once in a while, we have too much, but for the most part, you always just buy what you can get. Uh, but some of the lasers, like the uh, the laser that we use for the fuel in the Nissan engine, 100 microwatts. So. You can do this with, with transmitting only tens of microwatts. That's enough. You have to get careful. You have to do maybe use your two for one enough. You have to be careful. More power is usually good because there's never enough to cause the saturation problem we talked about yesterday. More power is good. Um, I suppose there might be some regimes where they worry about eye safety. We're kind of below that limit. So the main thing is you have to get enough light to the detector to be useful. And uh, how much you start with depends upon the fractional transmission. So uh, the commercial lasers are fine. Okay. So you measure the, the water uh, OH frequency, so you get the symbol, right? You get the concentration. Well, no, these are, these are row vibrational transitions. 
So remember, we spent a lot of time. Before we get, there's not electronic here. Uh -oh. These are, so NO is the first, is the fundamental vibrational transition. CO was the first overtone. The first overtone is 100 times weaker than the fundamental, but it's still good because we know how to do this WMS, which can be very sensitive. So for those path lengths, we, the reason for 2.3 microns is it's a lot cheaper than 5 microns. But unfortunately, it's not, if we go to the second overtone of CO at 1.5, it's not sensitive enough. We need that to get to 2.3 microns. And another point is, is that as you go longer in wavelength, then there's issues about optical fibers. I guess I didn't tell, tell you about optical fibers. It's hard to get fibers that work really past two microns or so. We have some tricks, but everything gets more complicated. So you might like fibers at five microns. Well, you can do it, but they're kind of custom or expensive, and we work on that right now. We need fibers to transmit light to a hostile experiment, to transmit five micron light to a hostile experiment. The fibers are kind of coming along, but slower than the lasers. The detectors are already there. The longer the wavelength, the more expensive the lasers, because they're just, that's the state of development. But eventually, they'll be cheaper. So you should always use the cheapest one you can use to get the job done. So 2.3 microns for CO. This is pretty amazing. We're measuring parts per million in real time. Any other questions? The number of particles? Yeah. So what if we wanted to measure the particles? So you can measure the particles by scattered light. So if we went to a non-resonant wavelength where there's no molecular absorption, we could look at the attenuation of that beam and say something about the particles. In certain limits, with certain models, you can say, like if you knew their size, you can say how many, how many per unit volume. If you don't know their size, that's a little trickier. But uh, you can say something about the particle loading and whether it's changing with time, just from the fact that you lose light by scattering as the light goes across. So in fact, we tried doing this. And we played with, because a lot of the light is forward scattered. And we were trying to keep this light. So we played some, some tricks. But the sponsor wasn't really interested in this, so we didn't do a lot. But you can measure, people do this. You can measure the, the particle loading usually get some combination of size and number density. If they're round, if they're a certain size, you can say how many. If they're a variable size and they're not round, it gets more more approximate. You can say something about the, vol the volume fraction of the particles from the scattered light. Yeah, you could use the same, if you needed that information, you could, you could get something. It would not be as quantitative as what I'm showing you for species. Can you do without purging the window, uh, for even for gasifier application, um, just to keep it clean? Could I what? Do without the uh, purging yes. flow. Yes. Okay, so, so that's where you get into what can you do without, the, uh, without purging. That's where you kind of get into the optical engineering. So there's the science and there's the engineering. The engineering varies from experiment to experiment. Maybe the experiment is clean enough you don't care. Maybe you only have to clean it once a week. Um, I think there's a lot of different scenarios. We found with that Nissan engine that they could run for hours and they pull out the spark plug and it would have lost some of its transmission. It gets kind of corroded on the reflector. I think each case is different. Um, you know, you can, if it's a long distance, you might say you could tolerate a small flow of air just to keep the end clean. I think it depends. Um, you certainly can keep it clean, but at what price? Uh, so I don't, that's, that's, people, uh, in fact, that experiment in the coal-fired burner, they built these tubes, Electric Power Research Institute built these tubes where they flowed air through there to keep them clean. That works. Uh, is that the best design? Probably not, but you know, that's an issue. Keeping the windows clean is, is an issue. Yes? So if you, this, I find this stuff, this is very interesting, especially the IC engines kind of stuff. If you wanted to get, I, and I, I hear you say this all over, there's all these tips, there's all these tricks that you've learned over doing this a long time. If you wanted to get started doing this, would you suggest starting on something simple? And then simple. Moving? If you want to get started in this, it's taken, we've been working on this. I started it in 1970, 
six or seven, worked on it for about five years. Stopped because my sponsor came back to it in 1990. Now we've been working on it steadily for 23 years. You pick up, you don't realize it at the time, you pick up these little tricks. Oh, you use that fiber connector, you use that. And so when you're starting, you don't know all these things. So start simple, recognize it's gonna take some time, you invest in the future. It's gonna take some time, but once you learn how to do one species, then it's not so hard to do another one. So it's, this is what you can do. This is what you can do. Uh, start simple, where you know the answer, try to do something where you know the answer. You have to see it as an investment. Don't start on it if you only have a month or a year or two years. But I think it's a long-term thing. It's, got, it's so powerful. Yeah, so people who tried to follow us sometimes, it take, takes a while to come up to speed. Um, so if you're an experimentalist and you're interested in an academic career or something, or maybe just an industrial laboratory, you, you only do this because you can see the continuing potential. You could use it here, you could use it here. This, the same idea, we could measure five different species. So once you've worked out the optical engineering, so it's, it's, like, a, it's like investing in, in, a, in a powerful technology if, if you need it. Yeah, start simple. Recognize it'll take a little while. Well, you'll get blocked by something you don't even anticipate. Oh, I didn't realize that effect. I didn't realize this headline problem. I, you know, it takes years. Students come in and they, uh, they're up to speed in a year, but that's because they're trained by a student who's one year further along, two years further along. All that, all that knowledge is there. So they come up to speed faster. Yes? So how long before this, like a set of diode lasers is like a package deal that they can put okay. it in a flow and use part of their control system? So how long before somebody could put this into a package flow? Are we talking about students or a company who sell, a buy, company see a company, a company is gonna sell instruments. They take science and package it and sell it. Well, how they, long before you see oh, this method being used? A couple of my students already have companies. So one of my students is a, is a, is a and, so, and some of my students are faculty. So students of, uh, two or three students who are presidents or vice presidents of companies. Uh, one of my students went back to China, started a company in eight years. He had 1,300 employees. I mean, he's a rich man. So, and other students are starting to do these ideas, and then of course you realize you have to decide what your, who your sponsor is, and you, you, you buy, you build things you can sell. I'm interested in the science. They might find that, well, they can make more money by using something that uh, measures the impurities in water, uh, liquid water, I mean, you don't just keep narrow. But um, somebody has to do the science, university people do the science, so we're not good at packaging instruments. We can go to these power plants, make it work, then some company comes along and they say, we can do that for you, and they, they, they run off with their ideas. But they're not so good at figuring out, well, why didn't you try this modulation idea? And that's what we're good at. So it takes a while, uh, but companies are doing it. There's, there's multiple, there's probably a dozen companies in the world that are selling stuff that's kind of like this. It's, it's usually much simpler than this. They're, less, they're more primitive, but uh, there are, they can sell them. And I told you that the Air Force is flying something like this on, on a scramjet. Another question? Yes. Uh, could you comment on the, what if the path length becomes a few hundred microns? Yes, interesting. What if the path length becomes a few hundred microns? So you always, when somebody says, could you do this, I always ask, what species, what temperature, what pressure, what path length? That, that's what you have to know. And if somebody says, well, actually, I've only got a one millimeter path length. Okay. Well, we just did this with five millimeters for hydrocarbons, and we have plenty of signal. So it depends on what species it is, what's the temperature. If it's liquid film, we actually, if it's liquid film, we can't measure a thick liquid film. It's got to be thin. It's got to be tens of micro, or it, it's totally absorbed. So one of my friends is doing this in Germany, and he's trying to measure liquid films, and, and, uh, and he's actually trying to measure the thickness of the liquid film, but in this way. So yeah, you can, you can measure small distance. It's always boils down to how much absorption or scattering is there. Is that enough? It's always just a question of signal. Another question? Okay, we ran over a little bit, so I guess we're supposed to start. To, we're supposed to start in uh, five minutes. We better start in 10 or 15 minutes. I'll go faster next time.
I'm going to talk about shock tubes and uh, then we're going to talk about why I like to marry shock tubes and lasers together.